The scene down at, I mean, I always call it down at the cross, <laughs> but the technical true term is glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within There at the cross where he took me in Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name There to my heart was the blood of life Glory to His name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet, plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood of life, glory to his name. Amen. You can be seated for a moment. Uh, I'd like to welcome each one here this morning to First Baptist Holland. Uh, thank you for each one here. Just want to remind you today at 2 p.m. is the baccalaureate service for the graduating seniors of Holland High School. Uh, everyone's uh, definitely invited to that. Look forward to that service and what Brother Tom has for us. We're blessed to have Tom Henderson with us this morning as well. Uh, look forward to what he's going to share with us this morning. And uh, again, thank you for the ones that are joining us online. Look forward to when you join us here in person. And right now, Miss Nisa Walker is going to come share with us. Good morning. It's my privilege. Ooh. Sorry. It's my privilege this morning to present a check from Holland ISD, an annual Holland Elementary plant sale to our local Holland Community Food Bank. I'd like to uh, thank Holland ISD, the administrators, the teachers, the students, and all in the community who have supported our plant sale and our food bank over these many years. And it is a great joy to share with you that God continues to grow this plant sale the very first year that it started, we sold $600 worth of plants. At 50 cents a plant, that was 1,200 plants that uh, second graders planted that actually came up. And that's in itself a miracle right there. Uh, but God continues to grow, and now we have kindergartners and second graders planting. And our check this year is $6,000. And... 
<laughs> Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a hand and everyone who has helped with that. That means this year we were a dollar a plant. So that means a, a six, and we had some extra funds this year that we're going to use to expand, hopefully expand the, the hoop house because we are growing and getting a little crowded. So that means over 6,000 plants were planted and came up. So um, give everyone who has supported the project and the Lord a round of thank you and a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Nisa, for that. And uh, again, that just continues to keep growing and growing. Actually, uh, before it happened, I was listening to a radio station and somebody was talking about the Holland Elementary School plant sale that was oh, happening wow. the next day. So uh, <laughs> definitely keeps growing and a lot more people keep knowing about it. And that's why I can't ever get the plants I want, Nisa. <laughs> anyway, let's continue singing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
favorites it talks about what I'm working trying to do every day is build my life on uh, who God is and the truth of his word worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. You are holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me. You are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust. In you alone, and I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are, and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me you be seated Linda Roberts come and bring us our scripture this morning morning. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark 2, 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered, <clears throat> so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So men, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on when Jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fella talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven, or just say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that they may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. 
He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that the miracle that you performed, we can still read about thousands of years later, that your truth is still just as it was thousands of years ago. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you so much for being our Lord. Thank you so much for sending your son Jesus that we are able to repent and be saved and be children of God. What an awesome miracle that you gave to us. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to lift up our church today as we're in need of that perfect person. We need someone to shepherd our flock. Please be with each member of this church that we might pray and use every means we can from you, dear Heavenly Father, to search and find and trust and know that you are still in control. We love you, Lord. Forgive us when we fail you. All these things are in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. This is our offering time. and. We're going to sing a song called Hosanna. Let's all stand as we do that. Those who are taking up the offering, come forward this time. Praise is rising. I saw. Turn to you, oh, bestirring hearts are yearning for you. We long for you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears washed away. Wash away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears washed away. Wash it away, Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We 
welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You can be seated as we welcome uh, Brother Tom Henderson to the Oh, good morning. I never really have understood this buffer thing here. Uh, last night was Saturday night. I did shower, I promise you, and because it was Saturday, I chose to use soap. But, uh, so bear with me, but uh, I'm thankful for the AV and all the amplification, and I appreciate so much you being here, whatever seat you're in. It is a joy to come and to be a part of the First Baptist Church of Holland on this day, not only to be able to share this morning, but also in baccalaureate later. I just made it real clear that I didn't get the sermons all mixed up. Because had I got them mixed up, then you guys would be thinking, well, I've already graduated, man. I've made my decisions. I get that. I get that. But isn't it great, though, as a church, that you can bless the local school district to say, hey, y'all come on over. We want to share with you and bless you as a graduating class and the teachers and the administrators. And I just think it's a wonderful thing and I'm so glad you have that privilege and that you accept it and take it as a way of sharing the light of Christ. It's great to be here today, and a lot of memories flow in my mind as I think about First Baptist Church Holland. Now that I'm uh, in uh, Medicare, I can say those things now about having all those memories and stuff. Used to I think, what's that old geezer going to say next? But now that I am one, I've learned that's some good stuff they talk about. We have 70 churches in our Bell Baptist family, and from those churches, I bring you greetings this morning. You're one of five of our BBA churches that are currently looking for a pastor. So you're not by yourself. But as I think about my experience here with Holland, it was when I was pastoring in Temple that I came down. I've known many of your former pastors and shared with them. And then when it became DOM, one of my first journeys uh, back in 2006 was to come out on that road over there and to look at a huge slab that had been poured for a church building. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little thoughtful about, hmm, those old boys are going to have to make quite a few good corn crops to make that thing come to pass. That was about the time Costa came out with Field of Field Dreams. But you know what is amazing? And I remember one of the members told me at that time, Brother Tom, this is the miracle on Dixie Street. And I said, well, I, concrete's pretty good stuff, but that's the miracle? He said, no, we're going to build a church on this slab for the glory of God without going into debt. And I thought, well, okay, let's see how that works out. And here we are. Dear friends, I would say, praise God, because this is a miracle on Dixie Street. And as we go through the message today, I want you to be thinking in your mind, thank God for the miracle on Dixie Street. Dear Lord, let's do it again. You see, because a bigger miracle is out there before us. This indeed was a miracle. God ministered and moved in so many ways. Uh, no one could have guessed. No one could have planned it out. No one could have written a, a screenplay for this drama that played out in this facility being built here at that time. But you know what? As big a miracle as that is, the bigger miracle is yet to come. And that bigger miracle is this. How will we utilize the resource we have here, the resource we have in the pews, the resources that we have in terms of our training and our focus? How will we utilize those resources to reach a community out in this Holland area that is increasing by the day? Amen? Just ask Brother Shane if you don't believe that. He's trying to find places for all those students to have a, have a place to learn. But think about the fact that God is moving in. Literally, he's bringing the mission field to Holland, Texas. Are y'all asleep out there? Is it not time to go to bed? Okay, I, I'm excited about that. I'm thinking, wow, what a tremendous opportunity. We may not can go overseas to do things that we kind of want to do, but God's bringing people right here to us. And as such, the miracle is going to be when we begin to see those folks coming in. And I was talking to Riley this morning coming in. He talked about 50 children in this place on Wednesday night. Isn't that a praise the Lord? Now we're getting there. 
Now we're getting there. I'm saying that God is moving in a way, and I believe he wants us to reach not only the children, but also their parents and their grandparents and anybody else having to show up with them because the gospel is for all people. But dear friends, in order for that to happen, we have got to get to the point to say, you know what? It's not my will, but Lord, thy will be done. Think about it. What would it look like? To see this baptistry used every week. I, one time at Heights, I was there, and we had a great time while we were there for those 15 years. And at the time, I said, well, Lord, I don't know it. We kind of slow down a little bit. And boy, we did. And I'm thinking, Lord, that last prayer, just forget all that, okay? Lord, I want us to wear that baptistry out. And so I believe there's such a great need in our community. And you know, all know the statistics. You all know what's going in down at Taylor and, and Austin. And that traffic, people are moving up here. You know why? Because they want the sanity of a place like Holland. Amen? Now some of the old heads are saying, yeah, yeah, they're making us insane with it. Now listen, this is an opportunity. You know, they show up, then we get to charm them. Amen? We get to love on them. Amen? We get to minister to them. We get to pour into them. And folks, that's going to be a decision. And I would say this miracle on Dixie Street is incredible. That miracle is going to be monumentous to reach all those people. But I want to talk about the miracle it's going to take today to reach the hearts in this room to get on board with that. Amen? That's what happened in our text today. Thank you, Ms. Rush, for reading that. Uh, beautiful job there. But in Mark chapter 2, we see a story here in the life of Jesus early in his ministry. He was in a little place called Capernaum. That was on the, uh, one of the uh, towns there on the Sea of Galilee. It was also Peter's hometown. And so Peter was a fisherman. He was doing that. Remember, Jesus called the early disciples there. And so now he's going out, as was his custom, to go into various places, and he would teach, and he would preach, and he would heal, and he would just do a lot of things. And every time Jesus came to town, boy, the folks turned out. They were so excited because they heard so many things about him. And as he got up and he began to do what he did and proclaiming the kingdom of God and reaching out to heal those that were hurting, and it was an amazing thing. And he just kept going from town to town, taking this message with him. And it came to pass during that time that there was a, a man who was a man who had palsy, is what the Bible says, some kind of paralysis, and he was kind of limited to his bed. And you can imagine the kind of life he was living how difficult that must have been. But this man had a treasure in that he had some friends. Anybody know what a friend is? That's the kind of guy that when you're up at 2 o'clock and you, you really got a real struggle in your heart, a friend is somebody you can call and say, get the coffee ready, I'm coming over. Now you can't do that with an acquaintance. And most of us can't do that with family, okay? They would tell us what to do with our problem. But a friend... Two o'clock in the morning, get the coffee on, I'm coming over. This guy had four of those. He was really blessed. And they had heard that Jesus could help people, and so they proceeded to get their friend to Jesus. I would like to say to you that that is really the core of what I'm talking about in this next miracle on Dixie Street. Look with me, if you will, as we look at this first point here. First of all, in order to be a part of what God wants us to be, to reach the people that are all around us, we have to keep our center and our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we centered on Jesus today as we think about what the future holds for First Baptist Church of Holland? You know, he was there and these guys, and perhaps these four men had, had been recipients themselves of Jesus' healing. Maybe they were satisfied customers, if you will. Maybe they had had some family members that had been to one of those meetings that Jesus had and, and, and they came back different than when they had gone. Perhaps they had heard Jesus themselves speak and teach and, and share with people. We don't know all of that background, but we do know one thing. This man with the palsy who couldn't get to Jesus by himself was helped by four friends because those friends were centered on Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in verse 5. When they brought their friend to Jesus, and wasn't that a dramatic thing? Every time I read that, I think about Bodie and I think about Rex, okay? Rex, because Rex is saying, I ain't fixing that hole. I ain't fixing that hole. And Bodie said, I'll get out and help lower the rope. 
But I can just see those guys involved in that. And you know, when Jesus, the, all the clamoring and all the banging and all this comes down this litter and it sits down there, and Jesus, the Bible says, looked up and saw their faith. He's looking up and he sees four faces there that kind of have worried looks on them. I mean, they took, a, they took a chance, didn't they? Didn't they take a chance? And all of a sudden, instead of Jesus saying, what are you doing, you knuckleheads? Jesus looked at them and saw their faith. Folks, that's the kind of focus we've got to have if we're going to make any dent into the rising population, not only in Holland, but I'm talking to all of our churches about that. We've got to get past what I want. We've got to get past what makes me comfortable. We've got to get past what is acceptable. We've got to get out and start saying, what's it going to take? What's it going to take to reach men and women, boys and girls, teenagers, with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's going to take us focusing on the Lord himself. Now, it's got to be more than just a religion. It's got to be more than just going through the status quo. It's got to be a rebirth, if you will, a a remaking of our focus so that it's not about a religion of doing good things but it's about a relationship of knowing the master and being so captured by him that his heart is our heart. His eyes are our eyes. His ears are our ears. And at his feet are our feet to go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Do you have that kind of centrality in your life? Well, preacher, I try. Hey, that's good. That's a start. You know, when these guys started this journey of toting this old boy to see Jesus, they assumed, I think, that, uh, you know, it's kind of like my wife and I. We just got back from New Jersey seeing grandkids and all that. And Sue, about nine weeks ago, had broke her ankle. Broke her ankle. And she was walking the dog, stepped off the curb, and the rest is history. So she's in a boot. She's got a knee scooter and all these things. She calls the airline. So I uh, say, what's it going to take to get me on that plane? She says, we'll take care of it, Miss Henderson, no problem. Got to the airport down in Austin. Sure enough, they had a scooter there ready to take us down there, get on the plane. Everything was wonderful. Flew nonstop from Austin to Newark, New Jersey. Not only do they not sell Pace Picani up there, but neither do they know how to operate a wheelchair. We get to the ramp, and I'm I'm now with with the scooter and all. The good news is you're the first one on the plane. Okay. Bad news is your last one off the plane, okay? And those little aisles, I have to turn sideways and suck it in to get down that aisle, okay? I'm just saying. So I get out, and I'm out there. The knee scooter we brought with us was in the luggage rack, and they brought it out, you know, and ready to go. So here comes this uh, young lady with a, with a regular-sized wheelchair, and she's going to ram that thing down that aisle. I don't think so. I said, we need a narrow chair. Oh. I didn't, ma'am, I don't know. We called ahead and they had it all figured out. Okay, then she took off. I don't know if she went to New York or Massachusetts, but she was gone for a long time. So the crew steps up and say, well, we can take care of this. I said, okay. Now, these are highly trained professionals with United Airlines, okay? The people that get you from point A to point B safe and sound. So they had an emergency wheelchair thing that in case they have to evacuate somebody out of the plane, it was an aluminum contraption made up of bars and straps and pads, and it was all in a big wad. They pulled it out of a container somewhere, and they got to working on it. And they worked on it. And they worked on it some more. And finally, this little guy came back from Massachusetts, wherever she went, and she comes bebopping up with a narrow scooter, okay? And I said, guys, let us get by you here. And they're still working. Then we went down and got Sue and brought her out. And I'm thinking now, I'm glad they know better how to fly that plane than to work that contraption because we would have been in trouble. Anyway, we got it and got all that cleared away. But you know, when those guys brought Jesus and brought this uh, paralytic to Jesus, I don't know that they knew what they were getting into. And then they thought, well, maybe somebody will see us and we're you know, disabled here and they'll let us park in front and walk right in. You know, no, no, no. These were people coming to see Jesus before they got changed, okay? They're just coming to see the show, okay? And so they're all crowded in, and you can't walk, that's tough luck. I'm going to see Jesus, you know. So again, you know, they had to work through some attitude. So they got to thinking they had an emergency uh, business meeting there and said, what are we going to do? Well, we don't want to bring him back because we haven't helped him. And there's no sense in starting a fight with all these people because they'll whoop us. So what are we going to do? 
So one of them said, let's do the unexpected. Let's get up on the roof, make a hole, and let him down. Now that's kind of like the, the Admiral. One time during World War I, they were trying to figure out how to deal with the U-boat crisis because the Germans had these U-boats and they were sinking ships and it was bad stuff. And so they got together, all the big wigs in the military got together, and this Admiral said, what we need to do, we need to boil the ocean. Those U-boats will pop to the top and we can shoot them. His, his subordinate said, sir, how are we going to boil the ocean? And Admiral replied, look, son, I came up with the answer. You figure out the details. And so these guys were working. Let's get up on the roof. But how do we do the details? So evidently, they carry a roof removal kit on their person. And they got up there. And these roofs are packed earth. They're thick. I mean, they're hard to get into. And so they're up there. Now, Jesus down here preaching, teaching, healing. Bing, ding, bing, bing, bang, bang. bang. Sound like a hailstorm going on while they're trying to do that. And all of a sudden, this stuff on the inside starts falling down. And I'm thinking they moved people out of the way and looking up. And no one arrested them or run them off because nobody ever done that before. They were just kind of shocked. What's going on? Well, they got a place big enough, and they were able to let the guy down. And think about the faith that must have took for that guy on that gurney, you know? I mean, did they tilt him? Did they dump him? I mean, just think about he's probably hanging on and strapped in for the ride, you know? And here they come, rolling him down, and Jesus looked up and saw their faith. Now, folks... Would we have that kind of faith to get our neighbors who play their music loud, to get our neighbors who throw their beer cans in our yard, to get our neighbors whose children run around like a bunch of wild Indians? Do we see Jesus clear enough that we see beyond our comfort level into what it means to get those neighbors to Jesus? An amen or an old me? Folks, listen, that's where the rubber hits the road. People are not moving in here, for the most part, like us. People are moving in here for economic reasons. They're moving here for work reasons. They're moving here for... Well, who wouldn't want to come to Texas, amen? They're moving in for all kinds of reasons, not necessarily for their lives to be changed by Jesus Christ. So we're the ones, we're the bridge, if you will. We're the ones that's going to step between. We're going to be up top. We're going to be lowering them down. We're going to be seeing them, greeting them, and bringing them to Jesus. We're going to be the ones that say to them, there's a better way. We're going to be the ones living a life that shows the difference. We're going to be the ones who bring them to Jesus. Well, I don't like them, don't want them, don't care about them. You know, I used to feel that way. When you used to talk to me before I came to Texas... I didn't want to come to Texas. I was in Florida, and I was happy. You say, well, what can make you happy about Florida? Trust me, I was happy. But then God said, Tom, you're going to Texas. And that was back in 1978. Now I am one, okay? And you know, my daughter, daughters and my son, they've all moved to the Northeast. And I didn't lose anything in the Northeast. But you know what? I've got two grandchildren now with one on the way. And so I say, you know, when I go up there now, I don't go up there mad. I go up there happy because I get to see Luca. I get to see Claire. I get to see, well, I will see. I saw the bump this last time, but I will see the third one. And you know what? Whenever we begin to focus on what's important, God has a way of opening our eyes like he did with these four friends to do whatever it took to get their friend where? To Jesus. We're not trying to make Republicans out of these people. We're not trying to make Democrats out of them. We're not trying to make independence out of them. We just want to make them born-again believers in Jesus Christ. And dear friends, that is our opportunity, our responsibility, and we've got to hey, center on Jesus Christ or it's not going to work. I mean, we can only pretend so long, amen? But when Jesus changes our heart and suddenly there flows out of us his love and suddenly there flows out of us his joy and his peace, it's amazing what we get into and how God uses us. But there's a second point here as we think about this next miracle on Dixie Street. First of all, uh, secondly, we've got to be committed to each other. Now, do you reckon those four fellas were all alike? I doubt it. I can imagine one of them being a bit plump. I can imagine a couple of them probably skinny as a rail. And I can imagine somebody else in some other shape. 
They probably had different opinions about things. They probably had different ideas about things. It probably took them 10 minutes to figure out how they were going to carry him to start with, and another 30 minutes how they were going to get him down that roof. But the point is they worked together to get it done. Think about that. There was a shared vision that these guys had. There was a shared effort that they put into it, but ultimately a shared faith that Jesus recognized. Who is it that you work with to bring people to Jesus? Who is it that you're praying with to pray that God would break through the lostness? Who is it that you drive out with and knock on doors and say, hey, we're here for the church and we just wanted to share with you how glad we are in your, you're in our neighborhood and if you need anything, you let us know. Who is it that you go over and talk to Shane about, hey Shane, how can we help you at school reach these families of these children that are coming in here? What do you need us to do? You see, folks, it's so important that we understand we start out in life, we're so independent, amen? Just like a Texan, right? You can always tell a Texan, just can't tell them much, you know? But that idea of being independent, you know, we're, we're our own man, our own woman, that kind of thing. And then we meet Jesus. And what happens? We become dependent. Isn't that wonderful? We're no longer looking at ourselves. We're looking at him and dependent on him. But there's another step in that maturity process in spirituality. And that is that we become interdependent. That is, we begin to realize that I can't do all this by myself, but I need my brother, I need my sister, I need folks helping me and working together. I need to help them, they need to help me. And just like these four got together to bring this man to Jesus, how are we ganging up on the lost world around us? How are we ganging? What's your Sunday school strategy to reach people? What, what's your strategy as your, your working crew, your, your building and grounds committee? What's your strategy to reach people for Jesus? What's your classroom strategy? Folks, listen, we need each other to do what only can be done. It's an amazing thing. Peter in 1 Peter 2 says, but you, he's talking about the group there, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he's talking there, it's all about plural it's not just about me. It's not just about you. But it's me and my family. It's, it's me and my friends. It's me and those that I hang with. All of us. What is our strategy to get people to Jesus? Well, preacher, I'm just going to live a good example and they'll see Jesus in me and, and that'll be fine. I'm going to follow St. Francis of Assisi that said, you know, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Listen, I appreciate... Uh, Francis of Assisi and his tremendous work, but people have misquoted him. They've misquoted him. Listen, it is about words. It is about sharing the gospel. It, certainly we want to live a life that exemplifies the gospel. We want to be good citizens. We want to be, be Christian in our behavior. But dear friends, there comes a time when God taps us on the shoulder to tell them the story. Tell them the story. Tell them what happened to you. Tell them how you came to know me. Let them know there's hope. Let them know there, there's a different kind of life to live. And dear friends, we need people around us that are encouraging us and helping us to do that. In college, we had a group of people, and uh, we made a commitment to carry a, a New Testament with us with the Romans Road underlined in it. Basically, it was verses out of Romans that shows a person how to receive Christ as Savior. And we had to carry that Bible with us everywhere we went. Fortunately, that was a semester after I had swimming. But anyway, we had to carry that Bible everywhere we went. And if we caught one of our friends, about five of us doing this, if we caught somebody without their New Testament, they had to pay up a quarter. Now, back in the day, that was in the middle 70s, we got pretty rich. That's pretty good, you know. But you had to carry that Bible. You had to be ready to share the gospel, to, to give a testimony of what Jesus meant. And if we caught you without that Bible, then you had to pay up. Dear friends, think about it the commitment we're willing to make. Are you involved in meeting needs in order to bring people to Jesus? You know, it is a process, I understand that, but it always has an end in sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. You know, as you're searching for a pastor, and uh, that is an important thing. You need a pastor, absolutely. Every flock needs a shepherd. But here's the thing. In Baptist life, Baptist theology, Baptist polity, one of the things that we stand out with is that we individually understand that God has called us, each one of us, 
to a ministry. And that ministry always culminates in leading people to Jesus. I love what you're doing here with the food pantry. And Man, I didn't know plants could, could fetch that much. That's incredible. Now, do those come with a guarantee, by the way? Can they get a refund? No, okay, I understand. But that's my problem. I can buy great-looking plants, put them in the ground, and you know what? I'm, I'll fate you be to get something to eat. But anyway, the thing is, that this idea of keeping focus and the reality that God has called us during this time of searching for a pastor, what I'd encourage you to do is keep doing what you do. Keep doing what you do and others join you. Wouldn't it be great for a pastor to come and say, well, I'm ready. He says, hey, pastor, we're over here. Come follow us. Because we're already reaching the community. We're already reaching out to people. We're already inviting people to come. And pastor, you come lead us and train us and help us. But we got this. We got this. And that's going to be such a great blessing to that pastor to know that you're ready, willing, and able as a, as a team to reach people. And then the last thing I want to share with you, not only have we got to keep this thing centered on Jesus, not only do we have to do it together and figure out how to get along with each other better, but we've got to really ask ourselves the question, do we really care about people? Now, before you oppose that and, and, and get all upset and bent out of shape, let me ask you a couple questions. When's the last time you presented the gospel, your testimony or just a kind word, you presented the story to somebody to receive Christ. Don't show your hands up, I'm just asking the question. Who is on the list that you keep in your prayer journal of folks that you're praying for who will be saved and you're praying for opportunities to speak to them? You see, folks, we talk about caring about people and if there's a tornado, man, we rush in with disaster relief. We try to help them out and all. But who's there telling them about Jesus? Who is it that goes out in the work of a world with a song on their lips, a love in their heart, and a testimony in their words? God is calling us during this time, and I pray that we'll hear that call, that we need to be the ones who love Jesus with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is likened to it, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. As you're thinking about your neighbor right now, that's the guy I mentioned a while ago that plays his music too loud and throws beer cans in the yard. Is your first response to call the police or to pray and ask God to show you how to win? Is that an amen or oh me? Where is our heart for reaching people? And again, I'm not picking anybody out in particular, but my question is, I believe if that heart was there, we would see a church growing and developing and filling out more so in the, in the absence of a pastor than perhaps with a pastor. I've known many of your pastors in the past, and I know they have shared this with you. I know they have modeled it for you. I remember one of the things, first things that Frank did, he came, and it was National Day of Prayer, and he said, we're having a drive-by prayer time. And most folks thought that was kind of unusual. But I thought it was kind of cool, so I drove all the way to Holland to come by the drive through prayer. I just told Frank something like I was on my way. But the idea was, that's a great idea, trying to let the community know we care. Remember Brother Randy, as he would reach out in the community with different aspects and things. Dear friends, we can carry that on without a pastor. Now, not for long, I said, well, get a pastor, but I'm saying don't just stop right here. Don't just wait for somebody to come to do the work. God has called us to do that work. As you begin to minister to people, you begin to share the gospel with people, it changes everything and everyone who is involved. You know, it's interesting, in a couple hours, I'll be preaching another message here. I promise it's a separate message. And um, you're thinking, boy, preacher, I hope you give it to them seniors. Okay, okay. You pray that direction, okay? You know the message I want to give those seniors? I'll talk about making choices. And here's what I want to say to them. You guys want to see what good choices are? Look at the people who go to this church. That's what I'm telling them. Now, are they going to snicker and kind of laugh? 
what are they going to say? Preacher, you're right. These people make good choices. I want to challenge you to make that declaration I'm going to give a reality. And I want to challenge you in the days, the weeks, the months ahead, regardless of what the full foot committee is doing and all that kind of stuff, I want to encourage you and challenge you, go forth into the highways and hedges. Reach people. You have good leaders here. You have a good church family here. Go out in the highways and hedges because it's not as hard to find them as it used to be. Man, you just look around and see all the houses going up. Guess what? Somebody's going to be living in every one of them. Now, you may say, oh, they've ruined our town. No, they turned it into a gospel station. Amen? They turned it into an opportunity. So let's ask God to make us the kind of people that it would take. Those who are centered on Jesus, those who are working together, and those who love lost people. There's a fellow told me something one time, and it kind of shocked me when I first heard it. But we were talking about churches and growing, and he said, you know, the leaders for your church, tomorrow woke up this morning with a hangover in somebody else's bed and I just thought what are you talking about but then I got to thinking about my own life I got to thinking about my friends lives that are now following the Lord what was our life like before we met Jesus listen it's deja vu and God has opened up the opportunity, as far as we can see, to have an impact in the lives of people. Will you do your part to pick up that litter and get this person to Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father, we realize today that we've got a task before us. And certainly, searching for a new pastor is one of those things that's out there. But Father, our bigger, bigger task, a bigger task, the big miracle that can happen here uh, with everything that's gone on before, but the biggest miracle is to see this church energized now, reaching out in the community, the highways and hedges, and bringing people to Jesus. Oh God, would you just burn that in our hearts? God, would you just speak to us about that? Lord, forgive us for getting so distracted and so uh, out there in different things. Father, just open our eyes to see the opportunity. Help us to understand what that would do for us as individuals, for us as a church, for us as an association of churches. If all of us would make it that, our cries that were, God, send me, Lord. Help me, show me, direct me. Father, just speak through me that they might know Jesus like I know Jesus. It is our prayer today, Lord. For our lives. In your holy name we ask it. Amen. Friend is going to come and lead us in a song. I'd like you to stand with it this time. And if God is speaking to you, I'd just like to encourage you to pray that prayer. Lord, help me to love people enough so they'll meet Jesus like I am. And as we sing together, how we do respond. If you need to come forth and make some kind of public decision, so be it. If you need to pray here at the altar. That's fine. Pray where you're standing. But let the Lord Set the agenda for these next few moments. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Live for you.
Thank you so much for being with us. Pray for the service at 2 o'clock today. We're looking forward to God speaking to hearts and lives. And uh, I guess that this, anything else, Brandon? To, anything else? We're good to go. Brother Clint, would you mind voicing our prayers? We're dismissed from here, please.